Good morning and welcome to 24 Hours of Pass, SQL Server 2014. We're excited you could join us today for Jamie Radian's session on SQL Server 2014 in memory OLTP, memory storage monitoring and troubleshooting. This 24 Hours of Pass event consists of 24 consecutive live webcasts. This is number 20. Recordings of these sessions will be available in two weeks time at 24hoursofpass.com and email will be notified when those sessions are available. I'm the moderator today for this session. My name is Neil Hambly, and I'm a chapter leader based in the UK. I have a few introductory slides first, and then I will hand over the reins to Jamie Redding. He will then speak for approximately 40 to 45 minutes, and then we will cover the Q&A session at the end of the, at the end, and we were able to answer any questions you may have from the session. Jamie, you can move on to the next slide for me, please. So if you require any technical assistance during the time that we are doing the session, please do notify uh, by raising your hand on the click button. Also, you can maximize your screen for better viewing the session at the top of the presentation window. And also, if you do have any issues or questions you want to raise, there is a section in the controls for you to submit your sessions or provide uh, ask for assistance. Next slide, please. Well, you need to thank Microsoft for providing the speakers and sessions today for this 24 hours of pass. Without them, we are not able to provide the excellent content and provide you the learnings from these sessions. So thank you very much to Microsoft. As you all may be aware, the PASS Summit 2014 is coming up in November in Seattle. And this is the largest gathering that we have of the SQL Server in the world. We have over 5,000 attendees from many, many countries coming to this. If you want to attend this session, uh, attend this conference, there is a discount code available from your local chapters, and you can save $150 off your current registration. The price does change on the 27th of June, so you've got a day or two to be able to register with the current low price that's available. And you can have a look at all the sessions that are now currently listed from the community, and that's available at sqlserver.pass.org. Or sqlpass.org, I should say. Please move on to the next slide, please. So I'm going to now hand over the controls to Jamie, and he will uh, give a little bio about himself and then uh, go straight into the session. Thank you very much. I will speak to you guys later. Remember, questions are available if you want to submit those. All right. Thank you, Neil. Thanks, Neil. So my name is Jamie Redding. I'm a senior program manager at Microsoft here in Redmond. I've been with the Microsoft and SQL Server team about 16 years now. Um, my primary focus has been working with the TPC doing benchmarking performance work. So I did that same work at IBM and Compact previously. So a long career in the performance environment. Um, so we're going to cover tonight or this morning, wherever you are, um, a look at the SQL Server 2014 and memory OLTP system and how we look at the memory and the storage monitoring and maybe some trouble, troubleshooting as well. I'm going to mix in some uh, demos as well to kind of illustrate some of the concepts that we're seeing out there. And so we'll kind of plow through as we go. So let's look at memory first. So when you look at SQL Server with memory structures, you've got memory being shared by different, pe different people, different functions size SQL. You have the normal traditional SQL Server buffer pool, the green block on the bottom. You have our internal memory structures, which don't go away. Those are the things we keep track of all our, our processes in the system. The yellow block is new for 2014. That's a memory optimized tables. So they're tables that are resident memory, uh, maybe durable, maybe non-durable, but they're living in memory the whole time. And the blue box at the very top is available memory left over. That's the extra stuff you had, extra headroom. So as you do more work in the system, you may add more tables to the memory optimized side that will consume available memory. Uh, one thing you will learn about memory optimized tables, they don't play well with others. So once we're in memory, we don't get ourselves out. So we'll have to start fighting for memory in there. So as you add more and more things, you're going to also have some pressure. And that pressure will come out of the buffer pool because memory optimized tables will, will keep whatever they've allocated themselves. As with our internal memory structure, we'll, be, we'll keep the same size. Buffer pool gets squeezed down and eventually gets squeezed down so far it's a ticking time bomb and the system starts to behave badly. So when you get to a memory pressure situation, what do you do and how do you recognize it? Well, the first thing is you'll realize that your other workloads will slow down. So they're now having to fight for buffer cache time. So the traditional disk-based uh, applications you're running will now be performing slower. 
You also will see in some of the cases of memory optimized, if you've overextended too much in the memory optimized environment, that you'll get out of memory errors when you start trying to run transactions against that. Uh, those transactions tend to be only the ones that actually modify or, or add data. The read-only transactions will still work, but again, you're looking at a, a out-of-balance system. So how do you get around that? Well, there's a couple of solutions. One is allow paging, and that was rejected early on because we don't do paging. Um, in memory LTP structures, stay in memory, we don't get out. Once we're allocated, um, it's basically a restart the system to get this, the, uh, or drop the database, drop the tables to get them out of memory. So the best way to do is to basically try and provision and manage your memory appropriately. Um, and we'll go through some techniques and some, and some tips and some demos that show you the tools that are available for that, that environment. So the steps you need to do is basically figure out how big your memory optimized tables are going to be. Um, row counts, um, which normally do for a normal disk space table, those things still apply for in-memory tables as well. So you can kind of estimate how much space is going to consume up there. Um, you can also limit that consumption of memory by using resource pools, and we'll see that in a little while in one of the demos where we talk about how to set up a resource pool that will take a percentage of your system memory and dedicate that to in-memory OLTP versus letting it just go wild out there. That way you can minimize the impact on your disk-based system and still let you use the in-memory system as well. And also using tools to watch what's happening out there, and we'll look at that as well as we go along. So one of the biggest things that, that will bite you or you'll be aware of when you're joining this system is the garbage cleanup. So as you do operations, inserts, updates, deletes, you're logging information, you've got these changes flowing around, and how do we get that stuff cleaned up and make sure we're using memory effectively? Well, we've designed a, a thing called a garbage cleaner or a garbage collector, and um, its design is non-blocking, so it doesn't block your transactions from happening. So as it's doing its, its processing in the background, your applications are still be able to access tables and not being blocked by that one. It's also cooperative, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, a little more detail later on, but basically it, it allows the different parts of the system to cooperate together to get this, this information cleaned up and, and put away. Um, offensive, responsive, scalable. The big thing is scalable, so if you have a multi-core system, then it will use all those cores. So if, if work goes to core one for cleanup and it's busy, that work will be shifted to another core in that same NUMA node. So you won't cross NUMA nodes, but you will cross cores in that node, so we can make that scalable across the whole system. So what's interesting about this as well is though, an active user transaction will actually do parts of the GC for you. So as, and we'll see that in a, in a second, you'll be having information that needs to be cleaned up. So garbage cleanup is heavy, it's ready to be going on. Um, a user will come in, do a transaction, it could be update, delete, whatever it is, and when it finishes and returns back to the end user, before we release the processor core, we'll do garbage collection and then move on. So that way we're, we're cropping across all the systems and not having a, a single thread dedicated to it or having to slow things down to make this happen. And if all else fails, there's a dedicated system thread in the background for garbage collection. If everything is, is kind of quiet and nothing's happening in the boxes that we can do as far as taking on the transactions, it'll kick in about every minute or so and, and basically schedule garbage collection that way. So that will happen automatically in the background for you. Now, what it looks like is this. It's kind of a, a weird picture. We're going to go through the demo that will maybe a little clear later on. But in the bottom, we've got our cores. This is a four-core system for demo purposes. Um, then we have a, a block of generations. So these are, think about, almost like a, a block of timestamps. They're saying that there's 16 of them out there. And as a committed transaction comes in and does something and deletes one or more rows, which is, remember, an insert is also, sorry, an insert is an insert, an update is a delete and insert, so you're going to delete for those as well. Um, we will keep track of those in the generation boxes, and those boxes are basically in timestamps, so we know what work went on where. So as the system progresses and we get enough work to handle out, we'll push those garbage collection processes out to the different cores and wait for a transaction to come through, one of our user transactions, Execute on core one, it'll execute, and then it'll do its garbage collection at before it returns the processor back to SQL. So again, we try and keep that, that kind of nice core moving and active at all times if possible. So I'm going to jump out of the presentation for a second and walk through a quick demo to kind of show you this process kind of working in hand. So I'm going to jump out of here, and we'll go back into SSMS. I've got a couple of scripts here, so I'm going to open up... Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is create a database. So I have a small database. Um, it's called IMOLTP, just for lack of a better term. So we have a database out there. Let me refresh to make sure everybody can see it's there. Um, then we're going to um, 
go through and create the table in this database, which is a simple table, three columns, an int, two cars, and now we have our table sitting out there. So one thing we can also look at, and, and the box I'm running on is an eight core system. So we can go out here and look at the course, the Q stats, and we should see, what's wrong one? The schedulers, and we should see a total of eight schedulers. So now we know that we're an eight core box, um, so we have eight things that the garbage collector can play with to get the work done. So the first thing I want to do is I want to run a little bit of transaction here and just insert 16 quick rows. So basically it's a little loop that runs through and insert 16 rows. So now we've got data in the table. And now we'll jump back over to our monitoring system. And one of the queries you can run is to look at what the GC, the garbage collector, is doing and what its cycle is. So right now, nothing really happened. The reason why nothing looks like it's happened is because the, the GC works in blocks of 16 transactions or 16 changes, if you want to think of it that way. Um, so we did 16, but 16 is not is still kind of being held in memory. So we'll wait a little bit, and we should get a few seconds here. It should kick in. And, of course, that's the, the joy of doing live demos. It's not going to kick in for us, is it? Let me refresh everybody and make sure we're getting everything we need, and we should see, voila. So now we have some information. Um, so this is, remember the, if you remember to the, the slide I showed, the generation blocks. This section here, oops, I should do that. This section here are the generation blocks. So we have one base generation, which is think of our timestamp one. So everything that happens now when we base in this timestamp, so any change that's made will be reflected here. And if we go run through, in every minute, the automatic GC thread comes in, looks at the change, oops, I found 16 more, there's a 16 rows we enter, inserted, so now it knows I've got a base generation of 16, and we're keeping track of the information that goes along. So now, to really make it kick in well, um, we'll go back and delete a row. So we'll just go grab the first row, and we'll delete that one. Jump back to our monitor system, and there is our delete. So we're still at base generation 17, but we now have a transaction copy to local. So now we have one we know is a delete in the system, and there's a generation one block for us. And these are, they don't look like time stamps, but they really are, are record aging information. So now we have that deleted. It's, it's gone from the user view, but it's not been collected from the, the GC itself. So it's still sitting out there, but the user doing a transaction to select star from that table won't see that row anymore. So we should get, okay, everybody said they're fine. Now, so let's go back in and delete the remaining rows in the table, which there'll be 15. We're going to delete 16. They're all gone. We'll jump back over to our GC monitor. Nothing's happening yet because, remember, he runs in a minute cycle. And we'll patiently wait. And finally, he will fire up, and we should see the base generation jump from 17 to 33. So. 1733, so we're now again aging that on the base generation column there. And now we know we have 15 items that we need to, to uh, handle. One thing I'll show at the bottom of the screen here, these are our schedulers, or the cores that on our, from our PowerPoint slide. So this says that on, on core 8, or you know, core 7 in the, in the zero scale, that we had one thing for garbage collection, six, a package of 16 changes in in that processor, and once the transaction that deleted those rows came through, it also dequeued them. So that means those rows have now been garbage collected and been cleaned up in the system. Also, you look at the number five of our cycle ID, we now have zero transactions copied to local. So that means now that we've done our, our GC and our, the rows are actually gone and moved out. So the next thing we'll go back is go back over here and we'll just do another insert in a transaction block, and then finally we'll hit it one more time, and we should see in a minute or so, there we go, so it came through now, so we have another more aging of rows sitting out here, so we have information sitting out in the GC that needs to be cleaned up again. So that was a, a quick look at the GC. Um, there are several blogs online on the SQL Server Performance Team blogs that talk about how to monitor this. Um, it's a basically simple DMV query to get the information back out, but it kind of helps you give you a feel for that the process is working for you in the background. So even though they're all going along fine, there can be some issues. 
So I'm going to switch demos real quick, but first I need to do a little bit of cleanup work. I'm going to kill SQL. So I thought it was. There we go. And then restart it just so it cleans up all the, the GC information so we don't look at anything that, that looks odd now. And I'm going to drop the database as well and get rid of it. So now it is gone. So the next thing we're going to do is look at what happens if you overcommit your memory and put too many things out there. So to simulate this, then we're going to use um, a resource pool. I mentioned that on the slides now. You can actually go through and define in a resource governor a pool limit for this database. So we're going to basically use the master. Make sure we get there first. Whoops, did that wrong. That was bad. I'm going to create the resource pool, which I think I may have messed up. Yep. So it's already existed. So we should back here in the management, we should see in the resource governor a resource pool for our memory LTP. And it's limited to the max memory of 20% of the max memory of the system. So now, make sure we didn't do how much I got here. So we got the database created. I think I may have hit too many things here. Let me back this out just for a second. I did the click the wrong button there. So let me kill the database. So the database will be gone shortly. Ah, the joys of live demos. There we go. Database is gone. So now we'll go back and create him. Now we're back. We have a, a database now. We'll refresh to make sure he's there. Now we're going to bind that database to that memory OLTP pool we created earlier. And then because we have to, with the binding, we have to take it offline and online. So I just take them offline. That worked fine. And then bring it back online. Now the resource pool will take effect. And now the memory that this pool, this database can access is terms of maximum in the system. So that's where we're standing right now. And we can verify that by just by doing a quick binding check to make sure that, yes, we are indeed bound to that resource pool ID. So the initial part is set up. Um, so now we're going to go back in and create our table again. This is same we, uh, similar to what we had before, four columns, pretty simple little table. And we'll fire that off. We have a table. So I'm going to set up a little loop here that runs just going to load, guess what, about 50,000 rows. So based on the row size, the memory limitation, this should fail eventually. So we'll fire it off. It's inserting, inserting, inserting. And we should get shortly a message saying out of memory if all goes well. There we go. So basically, we this information filled up our memory pool. So we now have no more time. No, we can't do any more inserts. We can still do things read-only wise. We can look in here and do a select count star from that same table. And realize we, that's how many we inserted. We came up a little bit short, but 6,300 records short to get the whole thing in there. So the nice thing is, even though we we are inserting rows, and we're trying to do ups and deletes. We did fill our memory up, we can still do read-only queries against that, so we're not completely dead. So if that happens, you can quickly go through and just alter the resource pool, get a little more space. If look over here, we should be seeing information as well. Now we've got base generations happening at different levels now. Before we were at 33, now we're at you know, a much larger number, which should equate to the number of rows in the table. If we down can go back in with our new memory limitation of our memory pool, our resource pool, I can insert another, what, 15,000 rows, and those are going just fine. You look over here, and we're still growing. Actually, we should see a big flood of information in the bottom window in about a minute. So what's happening is now is SQL realizes that you were, we're under memory pressure. And so what happens when it gets under memory pressure, the automatic garbage collector kicks in, and it will aggressively go out and clean those tables up. So I should have now my rows there. And now if I go through and delete these, we should see a massive change here. And this has went from zeros and ones to now 2,600 or so for each one of those things. So SQL so recognize that memory pressure was happening. Even though we had the memory the resource pool limit up a little bit, it was still very tight on memory. The delete forced a massive flood of deletion, so in queues and dequeues to clean everybody out. So now we have basically a clean system again. So that's out of memory and how you can watch that one. Um, most of it happens automatically, uh, but there are conditions where if you're too aggressive on your inserts, you can get to the point where you will run out of memory. The last piece I want to show you is a little more visual one, I think a little bit easier to, to look at. 
So one thing that OLTP systems right memory are, are very good for are shock absorbers. If you have incoming transactions, incoming data, uh, you can get to a point where you will flood your, your traditional SQL Server system where it can't handle the updates because of lacking and latching, locking and latching contention. So in memory OLTP systems take all that latching and, and, and locking from you so you can ingest data very, very quickly. But again, like everything else, there are some, some prices to pay for memory. So let me go back out here again. I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to stop SQL. Just make sure it's nice and clean for the demo purposes and restart him. Then we'll drop the database we created before. We'll create it again just to, for fun. And I'm going to drop, we'll do it via this. We'll just go ahead and drop the resource pool we just created earlier. Okay, so now we should have no resource pool defined if we do a refresh here and no database defined. All right, so we're in good state for the, for the demo part of it now. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create the resource pool. This is a little bit tighter in memory. Um, it's at 10%. That was done. We'll create the database, create the file group, and then bind it to our resource pool. We should have a database up here now. We'll do our normal take it offline and then put him back online to take to make sure that the resource pool takes effect. And so now we have everything set up fine. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up uh, Perf Monitor right in the background and I'm showing two different counters. And these counters are the whoops. These counters are from the resource manager, the resource pool in SQL Server. I'm looking at the target memory. Make it a little bit bigger here and the use memory. So target memory is what we define with our resource pool, resource governor, and the target down here in the bottom is how much we're using right now, which basically we're flatlining, which is a good thing. So next I'm going to create a table, and then I'm going to try a loop. We're going to insert roughly 5,000 rows in a batch, so it's going to keep basically Similarly, a, a, a shock absorber system. Insert rows, do some processing, and move them somewhere else. In this case, we're going to be deleting them, but you can move them to a disk space table for aggregation processing later, whatever it is. So what will happen is, as we fire this guy off, we start inserting rows. If we look at perfmon, we should see that bottom line should to climb up. So now that's the memory being consumed with those rows coming in in the memory OLTP system. And as we keep watching, it'll keep approaching that red line. So again, as the, the memory, in memory OLTP engine recognizes that, oh, we're getting close to memory pressure, it will take in 16 transaction blocks, parses back into all the cores, in this case eight in the system, and when the transaction of inserting or deleting finishes, it'll run through the garbage collection. So we're getting close to the line. It takes a few seconds for it to really get kicking in good, but we're getting close. So we're still consuming memory. We're still going to add memory error. We still have enough headroom. Transactions still running in the background there. Uh, we're getting closer to the red line. Here it comes. And we should see, if all goes well, a big drop in the black line. That's slowly increasing. Keeping our fingers crossed with the line. There it goes. So that was the, the GC just kicked in. So we were consuming memory like that. We're doing inserts, deletes, inserts, deletes. The GC kicked in, and memory is now free. So what you're seeing is the automatic GC process kicking in without your, your, your uh, interaction with the system. So it will keep that thing clean for you um, as long as you, you know, maintain, maintain enough space for it out there and are doing the proper monitoring things. So that was just a quick look at the GC and what it does. Uh, I'm going to jump, kill this out, and I'm going to jump back into the PowerPoint, and uh, we'll move on down the line here. There we go. All right. So let me go do this one and get back to, so that was memory. So basically you're looking at the, the garbage collector and using the DMVs for the, the sysstat so you can figure out what the queues are doing out there. The next piece is, is storage. So storage is very different in, in memory OLTP systems than it was or is in traditional disk-based systems. Um, you do still define certain information about the database and we'll look at that real quick. So this is the create or alter database DDL for building this table. Um, the key decorator is contains memory optimized data, so that tells SQL Server that this file group of this database contains memory optimized data, so it'll be thrown up in the memory and kept in that structure. And the other piece is 
you still have to build a container for it. So there's still a the container concept, and there'll be some I'll make some comments later on about how to size those things or how to to basically build those things later on. But you're still giving it a file name. What you're not giving it is a file size or a file growth. That's all handled automatically by by the MML TP system or the engine at that point. So when you create this thing, what happens? Well, you get actually two files. In reality, you get 16 files. So there's a data file and a delta file. So you get these checkpoint file pairs, and they are transaction time stamped, year range in those two, and they always come in a pair. So the data file contains all the rows that were inserted within that transaction time stamp range. So it's a pretty simple concept. Everything goes in there is fine. The delta file contains deleted rows. So again, same matching timestamp transaction range, but if you want to get the actual what the, the data is right now, you must combine data and delta together to get in case you know the row ID one was deleted at the delta file. So those two files kind of work hand in hand. So what happens in the process is in the background, SQL's watching these these tables or these files grow and, and shrink and do different things as you do different things to the, the transactions and the data inside them. And it gets to a point where Things get, I'm going to call it fragmented, but it's a, you can think that you're, they're fragmented at that point. So what happens is SQL will go in and merge them on a monkey for us. They'll, they'll merge them into a single cleaned up file. So this is a really awful chart, but I'm going to show you anyway because it kind of helps illustrate them. We'll look at a demo that kind of may make it clearer for you. So in the merge operation, we've got, in this case, where there's, we'll have two pictures of two file groups. The bars that are in green are data files with rows in the current timestamp range. So that's just our normal data files that we're working on. And then the, the red bars are basically the, the delta stores, the delta piece of that file. So as you're going along and, and the timestamp generation, base generation ID is now 500. So something kicks in and says, oh, we've got too many things in our, our delta files. We need to merge. So we're going to merge everything from 200 to 399. So that, that timestamp range. So we'll merge those files, and as of timestamp 600, which when it kicks in again, we'll now have this picture. So the first green range is still unchanged. The last two are unchanged, but the two from 2 to 399 are now in a merge state. So they're still accessible. You haven't lost the data. Nothing's there yet. They're just in a merge state. So the system will go through, basically organize those files into a new data file with its associated delta file sitting there for the proper timestamp range. And then once everything's done, it will get rid of those old files. So you basically compressed, not really a bad term, but compressing those two files together into a single unified file. So there's a, a process that happens across this, um, and there's some, some state transactions that happen, and they're, they're important now because we'll look at them later in the demo to kind of see what happens. So the first thing is when you create a table in an intermediate old TV database, we pre-allocate 16 files. We give you eight for data and eight delta files. They go in a pair. And then based on the file, the, the memory size of the system, there'll be different sizes. If your system has less than or equal to 16 gigabytes of memory, then each data file is 16 meg in size, and delta files are one meg. If it's greater than 16, then you get a 128 megabyte file and an eight megabyte delta file. So that you have 16 of those in every case. So that's the first piece of it. So as you start running against that thing, you'll see a file popping under construction. So this is the very first data file that you'll hit when you start doing inserts, updates, deletes to the database. Now, the one thing that, of course, because a lot is, you know, why do we probably get so much data up front? Well, the issue is that we need to have those files around so when we start going through the checkpointing process, the normal you know, minute, minute checkpointing process that SQL has, we want to fall behind, so we're having to we keep those files around so we make sure we have enough bandwidth to keep up with checkpointing and not cause any performance issues there. So under construction, we've now started committing transactions with a checkpoint, and the files that were under construction moved now to an active state. So this is our where the bread and butter happens in the system, the active files, and there'll be more than one of these as we will see in the demo. As you do different things, the database will have multiple active files all active at one time, all working in conjunction with each other. So after a while, either you do it manually, which you can do, and we'll see that demo, or the system does it for you, you'll start doing a merge. So the first thing that's identified is the merge source. So who are the files in question that we're going to merge together? Again, based on that base generation timestamp. Those will be calculated or pushed together and sent to a merge target, which as its name implies, it's the guy that grabs, that gets the information back, 
and that file becomes active. Now what happened here is in the little uh, box pops up on the bottom there, when you start doing merging, especially if you're in an HA environment, or even if you're doing normal traditional backups, because the same backup restore process works for in-memory tables versus uh, disk-based tables as well, we have to keep some state information around to make sure that if you happen to be in an HA system, we know that that merge happened and we can keep track of it. So there'll be a, an extra file that'll come up, extra data and delta file that'll pop up, but you can't delete, never merged, and they're basically used by the backup and, and HA processes. So now you're merging right along happily, the auto merge is working just fine every minute or so, the checkpoint kicks in, and eventually you get some files that are, are done. So we've, we've merged them, we now have the old active file that is no longer being used, and they are in transition to Tombstone now. So they are basically flagged differently and release them back to the SQL engine, not the email, but the SQL engine itself, and in turn SQL will take her and, and Tombstone is basically and get rid of them for us. So that process happens in the background automatically. Um, you can control it yourself if you want to, but it, it runs well with very high transaction, high ingestion systems pretty easily. So, so I mentioned a minute ago that you can also do backup restore. It's the exact same function you use for disk-based tables works for in-memory OTP tables as well. But they do it a little bit differently. So we'll see that in the demo in a couple of seconds here. But based on the state of the, the file, so if it's in pre-creation, active, whatever, you will get different things in your backup. So a pre-created file, when I back it up, it's empty. So there's nothing in there right now. It's just basically for our internal use. Under construction is also still empty. When you get to an active file, only the used bytes. So the file could be 128 megabytes in size, but if we're only using 10, you get 10 megabytes. You don't back up all that free space. Um, same with the merge source. We just use the bytes that are used there. For merge targets, empty. The, the backup HA only grab the bytes that are used. And with the tombstone file, either in transition or tombstone itself, we don't back them up at all. There's no reason for those things. So the, the merging part is, is can be relatively confusing, so I'm going to try and run through a demo and hopefully that will help uh, solidify what it is. So let me jump out of the PowerPoint for a second. Um, let me change my SSMS here and get to a different one. And make sure we're cleaned up. So I'm going to delete this database, we'll re reboot it again. And just for fun, I'm going to bounce SQL Server one more time to clean it out. All right, so now we're back up and running again. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, we're going to basically create our database and get everything set up for the demo portion of it. So I'm going to go through, uh, use the master, make sure it's connected, create database, and there is our in-memory LTB file group. Now normally you, whoops, I must tell, didn't delete it yet, that's why. And okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a guy over here that's still connected. Now let's try to figure it in. And he's not going to drop, is he? All right, let's refresh here. And now it's gone. Okay, let me rebuild it one more time. And we should be, okay. Let me do some major surgery real quick and we'll get this fixed. Okay, let's try that one more time. We'll create them again. Okay, well, that was great. So for some reason, he's not going to come up here. That guy is running. Okay. That's bizarre. It doesn't look at us there. Let's disconnect and reconnect. Connection. Let's disconnect this guy as well, and then we'll connect back into him. Okay, 
Let's try this one more time. Well, I'm at a loss now. For some reason, I'm not coming up here. Let's do this. The joys of live demos. It's possible, but okay. Something is hung somewhere. And I don't know why. So that's there. Okay, one more place to kill it, and then we'll keep pledging along here. So. If you put that, okay, I think we're back to where we want to be. All right, I apologize for that one, but at least we got it back. So, we have a database now. Um, so I'm going to go do one thing that you normally wouldn't do. I'm going to use a trace flag 9851, and I'm going to disable the auto merge process. Um, if not, we won't see the demo because it just keeps merging itself automatically in the background, and nothing really looks that impressive. So I've got that turned off, and I'm going to set the recovery to full, so we get the full log backups. And then I'm going to go through and create our table. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is, is show you what happens now to the system. I go over here and look and run this query. There are our files. So you've got eight, because I have eight cores. Actually, there's eight data files, eight delta files, plus our under construction files. And notice the size. I mentioned they will be larger because this is a, a greater than 16 gigabyte machine. And we've got an eight meg and a, a basically 128 meg system there. So everything's ready to go for us. It, it's in a, in a good state. So the first thing we want to do is um, look at the files in the file explorer. So back on our E drive where I put the database, and it's going to be in this one, we now have, in this bizarre direction structure, these file stream files. So they equate to the same files you'll see, you can see that one, the files here equate to those there. So files those are the same, so they actually are building these files. They're also all file stream files, so they're all sitting out and just ready for us to go. So the first thing we want to do is run a backup. So as you mentioned before, the pre-allocated files, the backup should be empty. The under construction file should be empty. But I do have a little bit of setup, so 344 pages of basically state information and setup information. So if we look, let me bring up another explorer. We look in our backup directory, so on the E drive, and it should be this guy right here. We now have an empty backup file, which matches the file that we had here. And notice it's about 5.5 megabytes. So that was basically the information that we keep for state. So let's go back in and put some data in this thing. So now this little loop goes through and runs, inserts 8,000 rows in the, in the database. So we'll run that one. We have 8,000 rows, and I'm going to go ahead and do a checkpoint. So what the checkpoint will do is, it'll go through, notice that we have here now, I'm going to run this query again. Now we have active files, so our, our under construction went away, and now we have an active data file. There is, guess what, our 8,000 rows just inserted, there is a file size, and since nothing was deleted, there's no um, information for deleted row count, but now we have also a, the active delta file for it. So there's the first step in the process of, of the files. So now, to get some deletions, we'll go through and delete about half the rows. So everything we're going to just basically get rid of. That happened. We'll run our checkpoint. And when we checkpoint, again, we're happy to automatically or via your command. We'll now see more active files happening. Our deletes are happening now. We're seeing our answers are there. So now the system is working fine, keeping track of all the data you have out there plus the changes for it. And we now have also multiple active files now. 
So if we go back to uh, this script, now let's back up that part of it. So we haven't merged yet. We've just done some inserts and deletes, and we did a, um, some checkpoints. So now we have a new backup file, but it's much larger now because now it has 4,000 rows of data plus some state information for the Delta store. So we have all this stuff put together now. So we have a, a backup file that we can restore somewhere else we want to. So that's a nice thing to have. We've got that going on. Everything's looking good. So now let's go back over here, and we want to do a manual merge. So this is the, the piece that you normally wouldn't do on your own, but you can if you want to. But the system does it for a math people can demonstrate it. So the first thing we do is find out what our lower bound transaction, our timestamp, and our upper bound are, make sure they match. So we're going to basically run a merge, merge checkpoint files from that region. So we'll do our merge, and look over here, and voila, nothing happened. And that's okay, because what happened was we basically posted this to the system and said we want to do a merge. And if you look at the, the status for it, it is now pending. So it knows we want to merge this time range into a single file now from the multiple files that can contain it. So to get that to happen, let's see, where was I? We're going to run a checkpoint. And this checkpoint will force the merge to happen. Merge process happened. We look over here now at our containers. And now we have a merge source, both data and delta. So now we have that, that state transition from, from active to a merge source. So that part is, is ready for us to go. So the next piece we want to go back in is, let's see, we'll back that up. And we should see a different size. And now we have, after the merge, a little bit bigger. And that's because we now have this merge source file happening. So we haven't done the full word commits by the wrong word, but we haven't done a checkpoint that really basically forces to happen. So if I do my checkpoint, and we jump back over here, we should see that merge source now become merge targets, and we have our required background for HH. Now we have our information Files merge together. That's our file we can't delete because that's for HA or for backup purposes, and that's all good now. So the last piece we had to do is we do a log backup now. Now we're going to do a log backup, and this will make things really interesting. So we'll do a log backup. We get our log backup here. Um, so at that point, we know we've got so nothing really changed here. We're still in a good spot. So the next step is I'm going to go back in there and run another log backup. So we're basically forcing things that, that normally wouldn't happen in the real system, at least in this amount of time, but they'll happen for a production system as it goes through. So we'll keep running things off. Whoops. Missed the carriage there. A couple log backups. If you'll notice, our log files should be getting a little bit smaller because the changes have all been committed there with the checkpoints. And now we need to figure out that we have tombstone files. So with all those blog backups, because the data was not committed to the log, we now have files we don't need anymore. So they have been in the tombstone state. So if we go back and run, we can look at those files. Oops, wrong one. So this process will basically, if you run it a few times, Notice we now have two unprocessed items. So if you look over here, we had two tombstone files. So those are now basically in the processing state. Run it a few times, it will jump now to, I have two marked for collection. Some quirky thing where it jumps back to two files, and then finally we get the two collected items gone. So the two files have been tombstone, thrown back to SQL, and, and, and basically gotten rid of from your Emerald DB database. So it's kind of a, a kludgy demo, but it basically this all happens in the background for you automatically. So as normal checkpointing process happens, as a normal backup happens in your system, this merging operation comes to the system and makes sure that you're, you're packed as tight as possible. So I'm going to jump back to the presentation. Let's see if we get back here. And just a couple of uh, guidelines for this one. So what we normally see in the past is if you think about how big your durable tables is, this doesn't really apply to the non-durable side, but you want to think about basically making 4x of the, the table size your memory size because of all these structures happening out there. 
um, in practice, if you're doing a heavy update workload where there's lots of churn, you know, like the shock absorber environment, you're doing inserts and then deletes and inserts and deletes, um, usually it plateaus around 2x. So it's not that bad. On the containers, when you create your database, the, the, the file, store, file stream storage area, um, like anything else you in SQL Server with your logs or else, the more spindles, the better. We love spindles, so the more you can put out there, the better it'll be. Um, there are IOPS requirements for it documented in the, in the books online. Make sure that the devices meet that. You know, SSDs are great environments for this one. And if you have multiple spindles, um, kind of the best practice now is if you have an even number of spindles, so if you've got 10, you create two containers per spindle. That seems to work really, really well. If it's an odd number, only nine, put one per spindle. Again, those are basically just rules of thumb. Um, you know, your mileage may vary on a lot of stuff. So, um, so I think we're done. I know I'm, I went kind of fast on this stuff, and the demo was a little bit confusing. I got myself confused there. But hopefully you saw that, that there are enough tools inside the, the memory LTP engine and SQL Server to monitor what the GC, the garbage are doing in the background for you as it does its processing and also the merge process. And the beautiful thing is it all happens automatically for you. You don't really worry, worry about it at all. But if you want to see what happens or, or see what's happening memory pressure-wise, you can use those DMVs that are documented to, to go back and look at that information. So with that, I guess I'll push it back to Neil. Um, if we have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those if I can. So thanks, Jamie. Uh, there's no current questions, but this is the time now for you to raise your questions in the controls. You can post those in. While we're waiting to see if any questions do come through, uh, I'm going to throw one out myself. Uh, Jamie, you know, where can they go to maybe get some you know, more tutorial examples and kind of maybe some written kind of documentation around troubleshooting steps? So the best place is um, we just refresh the books online. So when you go in there and you start looking down the memory and storage information, it actually now has references to our perf blogs. Um, so we can go back and look at the, the developers have a, a series of blogs they have posted for this information. So it's documented there a little bit and it references that to the blogs that are kind of even fresher because they're changed on, a, on an ad hoc basis versus the, you know, once a cycle books online gets updated. So that's the best place to start is there. But I will say it's a black art still. So. <laughs> Of course, uh, anything new takes a while for, for the skills to disseminate out into to, to the audience out there. Would you have a question come through um, around the, the scripts of the demo? Will you be making those available um, to, uh, to, to the users? I definitely can if you'd like them, yeah. Um, I'll talk to you guys if you're going to do that one. Yeah, we can make that available as well, no problem. Sure, so we'll, we'll probably make that available in one of the, uh, the updates uh, when the sessions have been recorded as are available, which is usually around about two weeks from uh, the, the time they're, they're done, so in a couple of time weeks we should have those. Um, I've seen no more further questions at this time, um, so what I'm going to do is uh, wrap up the session for you. Uh, thank you very much for providing an excellent and informative session around troubleshooting of this. Um, it seems like there's a lot of information to kind of learn and kind of work out how the engine's kind of doing its, its background, garbage collection, etc. So it's great to see you do that. I get some response saying great session, by the way, so uh, awesome there. Um, Our pleasure. It, that's, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. We'd like to thank, uh, again, Microsoft for being able to kind of put these sessions on and Jamie specifically for actually giving us a, a, an excellent session right now. Um, we're going to end the session, and thank you very much. There's more sessions to follow after this, so please, uh, if you can, kind of join those other sessions. Great. Thank you, Neil. Thank you.